This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside Bob Pastorella, we're going to be reconvening with J.R. Park for part two of our conversation. And this is a conversation we recorded a few months back to mark five years of the Sinister Horror Company, which is happening right now in April. So, for the origin story, you're going to want to go back one episode to 341. But in this episode, we talk about the future. We talk about what some of J.R. Park's plans are in terms of the next five years of Sinister Horror Company. We also talk about movie adaptations and how J.R. Park reacted when he was approached about adapting one of his movies, what that experience was like, what some of the questions were, some of the things that he considered. And then we also get to some of the Patreon questions. So a lot that we're covering in this episode, but before that, before any of it, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Following a cryptic message from her brother, Beth Davis finds herself in the strange coastal town of Netherworld Bay and discovers a secret cult planning to bring about the end of days. Can she stop them in time or will she lose her very soul forever? The Netherwell Horror is a terrifying blood-soaked tale that is not to be missed. Available in ebook and paperback and now on audio, search The Netherwell Horror on Audible or Amazon now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley, narrated by R.J. Bailey, is the brand new audiobook from This Is Horror. Including the British fantasy award winning story Shark Shark, dive in and download Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley on Audible today at bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning in the U.S. and bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning UK in the U.K. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. Let us not delay. It's part two with J.R. Park on This Is Horror. Well, let's move away from chronic health conditions and back towards the Sinister Horror Company. So we spent the last hour or so looking back on the previous five years. So... I'm wondering, what are your aims and what are your plans for the next five years? Wow, for the next five years. That's a good question. Um, I think at the moment, what is our plans? I mean, our plans at the minute is obviously to get bigger. Um, We are still a pretty small independent press. Um, Some people know about us, but there's a lot of people that don't. Um, which I'm totally disgusted about, and I think people need to sort it out right now. Yeah, um, I'm very ashamed of them, to be quite <laughs> honest. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, yeah, in all seriousness, we are, you know, I, I, you know, I understand in the grand scheme of things, you know, I'm not a, a, a big press at the moment. Um, we are very small, but we can still reach a lot of people. There's still loads more people out there that we can uh, get hold of. So I need to... One of the things I'm looking at, as I say, there's there's all the back cat is promoting that. There is the there's the awareness, so it's pushing the brand. It's the advertising, and it's how to get out there and get noticed more. Um, and there's various different ways of doing that. Um, one of the ones, you know, we talked about StokerCon. You know, we're going to go there. We want to go there relatively big. We want to make sure that people um, don't leave that place without at least seeing our branding and seeing our name so when they walk away and they see us again somewhere else they'll go oh yeah i recognize that logo let's go and have a look into them um so it's pushing from that 
I want to, um, yeah, I want to get some more different styles of story up. Um, you know, we've got a big range of of, of uh, genre releases at the moment, but I'm still missing a few uh, different types. I haven't, we haven't really had um, a traditional uh, ghost or haunted story as of yet. We had a really good uh, ghost story um, and, and book by James Everington. Um, trying to be so quiet, which is mm. fantastic, but um, but it's a very different take on ghosts. So, for people that want to have that Mr. James scratch of a ghost, I'd like to have something along those lines at some point. Um, yeah, and I just want to push ourselves into I don't know, maybe into multimedia. We may look at doing so. We, you know, I've been doing a lot of work with films, so whether or not we actually do anything with films would be fun. Uh, but it's really got to make sure that the the books are propping themselves up and uh, selling well before I can do that. Because uh, it's a big expense producing a movie, even a micro budget movie is still you're still talking what forty thousand pounds, sixty thousand. Yeah, 000. yeah. So that's not cheap. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the plan. I've got some. I'd like to get some more of my own books out right, um, at some point as well. So, as I say, that's pro- probably at the moment what I've been doing is I've, I've released a lot of stuff. We've got, had, um, we've got three books coming out this year, which are all, all ready to go now. So this is a time where I'm just taking a little bit of time away to work out how I'm going to write, which is kind of, you know, how we've discussed my technique and my method of writing uh, whilst adapting to the pain. But at the same time, it's that case of well, I haven't actually written a, a long a piece of long fiction for some time as of yet. Um, so it would be good to just get that under my belt. So the next couple of months is going to be done looking at that. And then I'm going to come back and start looking at um, some of the Sinister Horror Company stuff. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it'd be great. I mean, whether or not we can push ourselves into international markets would be wonderful as well. Um, but that's something that I haven't pushed or looked into um, just because I've been focusing on trying to build. It's all been about building a brand and building a, a varied range catalog of quality stuff. Um, and this first five years was effectively like the first main phase. And so after that, we're going to go into the next main, the second phase, uh, which is all about making it a viable business mm. with um yeah we good profits really that's that's kind of the idea i mean hopefully we've got um we might get a bit of interest because uh, i sold the movie rights to punch i don't know if i mentioned that to you guys before no um, I, don't, I don't think you did but i mean we, we'd love to hear how that came about oh uh, yeah that was yeah that was good so um so punch my second book uh, and we were talking earlier about how back cataloging, you know, there's no sell by date on it. I mean, Punch has been out for nearly five years now. Uh, no, in fact, it is five years. Uh, and uh, I got a message from, uh, from a producer over in LA. What they'd done is they'd, they'd, read, um, they'd read some reviews. They'd read a review of Mad Dog, I think, um, to start with. Uh, and then they read Mad Dog, and then on the back of that, they then read Punch. And then they, they contacted me via my website uh, just to ask whether or not the movie options were still available for both of them, to which I said, yeah. We had a chat over a couple of times, a really nice guy, uh, and then chatting about the actual properties, he decided to take on uh, Punch. So the movie options are with them at the moment, and they're just working on the first draft of the script i had a phone call with him the other day and it was great having a chat about what the what they've done with the script how he's been thinking about it um what changes that they've made because obviously it's a different medium um so you know there's whereas um you might have exposition told one way in a book you've got to tell it potentially differently in a film so yeah he'd gone through told me all of that which was fantastic uh really enjoyed the things that they'd done and so hopefully i think next week i should be getting a first draft of the script um to look through and to read 
and then to provide my own comments on, which I think is great because I personally thought sold a movie option, you tell it, and then they just go off and do whatever they wanted with the, you know, with the story and create their film out of it, and I just you know get some money for it but to actually be involved in the creative yeah. process of this uh is actually really really nice um yeah so so i'm excited about that and i'm looking forward uh to it going to the next stages and hopefully getting greenlit and being turned into an actual movie but if that does happen which um which it should do uh not only is it going to be like a tick off a list for me of saying yeah you know got a got a book turned into a movie but then also it's just fantastic advertising and great advertising for the company in itself. Um, so, yeah, if that happens, then that will be a major, major boost for us. Oh, yeah, definitely. And in terms of film adaptations, I mean, having spoke to a number of writers, it does seem that either you get the option where you sell it and then they do what they want and you don't really hear from them and you get some money. Or on the other hand, you get the experience that you're getting where you're working closely with them. And I mean, certainly that one is the more desirable one. I suppose the third option is you sell it to someone, they keep the rights for ages and then they don't make the damn movie. I know that happened to David Moody a few times, but... Yeah, I mean, it It can be frustrating, but... Yeah, yeah and if that happens, that happens. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if that happens, well, you've just got some money. So yeah, which, which is you. never a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but, I, you know, right from the kind of start, I was... Well, I, I did think about, you know, what if these things were turned into movies and mm. books? And I, I often thought to myself, would I be really protective over it or would i go down the route of of not caring uh i mean interestingly what do you guys think uh would you, are you would you be protective over uh your own properties or would you be take the money do what you like well this is something i've been thinking about a lot recently because i've got my novella the girl in the video coming out in a couple of months and yeah. i really think it would work very well on screen so i mean i'm eager to get that in front of some producers and to see if anyone's interested in it. But I think the most important thing for me would be researching the company and a producer, checking I think they're legit, checking that I like other works that they've produced. And then for me, I think once it's been sold, it's like an artistic collaboration. So if I trust the producer and I trust the company, whether or not I'm involved, that's kind of up to them. I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't be so precious about it that I'd want to write it. I mean, I, if they wanted me to, then great, but I wouldn't insist on that. I wouldn't insist on being involved and seeing every draft. I mean, I, if, if, if they would allow me to, then that would be great, but it certainly wouldn't be a requirement. And I mean, it's the same when I get my stories adapted into audio because I'm seeing it as an adaptation. I'm almost excited to see what they do with the material. And I mean, I think it was Sean Hudson who said that when he sells a movie, if it if it doesn't do very well or he doesn't like the movie, he says, oh, well, you know, it was a bit shit because it wasn't my story. And then if if it does do well, he says, well, of course it did well. It was based on my book. So you kind of win <laughs> either way. But I mean, I, I think like I, I wouldn't want to be too insistent about getting involved because if I can sell one book and have it made into a movie, I'd quite like to sell a few more and I don't want to have them say like oh you know Michael David Wilson he was an absolute nightmare to work with and he wanted creative control at every kind of hurdle and I, I think yeah if you approach it as a collaboration and you let them get on with it I mean also it's showing that you trust them and you trust them to do the right thing which is why I think researching the company beforehand is a good move. Mm hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I think it has a lot to do also with how 
deeply you are involved with the medium. If someone wants to adapt something of, you know, a, a story that's, you know, like either, you know, novel, short story, novella, it doesn't matter, novelette, uh, and they want to adapt it, you know, to me, it, it's like, okay, I, I've, I've handled the source material. Let's see what you can do, you know, as far as, as, as making it, it fit into a different, different medium. But say if I have a property that I feel is only going to work as a script, then I've got a lot more control over that. I have I have a particular story that I, I me personally I feel like the only way it's going to work is if it is in in a film, uh, which may not may not be true. May you know kind of actually kind of show display my limitations and how I can present the story. But at this time, I think it only can work in a film. Uh, which would means I would have to, you know, if I want it out there, then I'm going to be the writer. I'm going to have to actually write the script, which is not an easy thing. Um, I mean, I'm still working on it and I'll probably be working on it for a long time because it, it's, it's, it's a new, it's a different way of writing that I'm definitely still not used to. And, uh, it, you know, it's a learning curve and I don't want to, you know, go, hey, yeah, I wrote a script and I think it's pretty good, you know, and then send it off to somebody and they're like, hey, man, this is not how you do it. <laughs> and be like, oh, wow, well, okay. And so um, I learned the format wrong. Wow. <laughs> you know, so back to the drawing board again. So, you know, there's a lot of research, a lot of reading about how to write scripts, a lot of reading of scripts. At that point, I've invested a lot. I'm thinking, hey, I need to have a little bit more control over it. But then again, money talks, you know, and there could be a company that's like, hey, we like your idea. We like your script. We're going to use parts of it. We're going to pay X and that's all you get. And if X is a lot of money, I'd be like, fine, that's fine. You do what you want. <laughs> you know, so it all depends, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> I think I agree with you there, Bob. But you're right. I mean, script writing is a very different medium, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, it's a fair mm -hmm. style. I was fascinated when I was chatting with the chap who was working on, on the script of Punch, and it, he was just explaining, like, how he'd taken the book and how he'd pulled elements out of it, um, like like the speech, et cetera, and then run, runs through it, and then sees, okay, so, so, so what's missing here? Um, you know, what? what was in the text which i haven't transferred over across and and why would that potentially work in a in the book but not in the film and how i'm going to have to relay that similar information in a very different way because in a book you can put information out through narrative it's very easy done but you can't do that in a in a script so you can uh, you've got two choices you do it through dialogue or you do it through action yeah it's only what you can see and hear so you can't if you have like an internalization, you have to show it. Yep. You know, you have to, and you have to, to write that script where the director can interpret what you're meaning. If you've got a guy who's jonesing for a fix for drugs and you, but you, you can't get into his head then, and he's waiting on someone to bring him something because he doesn't have a car then you're going to want to show this character, you know, kind of, you know, jittery, nervous, looking out the window, uh, kind of paranoid, sees a car, thinks it might be a cop, you know, those type of things. And whereas if you write that in a story, you can unpack that over shit. I don't know. So many pages. <laughs> it's, it's almost unlimited on, you could make your whole story about that concept. Yeah. You know, so it's, 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 you know, you got to think in, in a way that you don't necessarily think when you're writing a story because you you can use in, internalizations, whereas in a script, it's only what you can see in here. Yeah. And also, you also it's about market and saleability as well. So you can write something. It's like the choice of writing a book is that it's just one person, their imagination sat down there writing. They produce the book. It's the cost, however much the book is, and then how much you want to put in to promote it. But that can be, it doesn't have to be an astronomical amount. The moment you've got a film and you're trying to write that, you're thinking, well, how much money seriously has to go into this budget 
and that's a lot of money to invest. So they then got to think about, well, how can they, who can you sell it to? You know, so right. y- 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 do you know what I mean? If you're going to invest, if, you, if, you, if you've got a script and you're saying, right, this is going to take, I don't know, we'll call it a small budget. It's going to take a, a million pound, right? That's a million pound that someone's got to put up front and then they've got to try and recoup that money back. You're not putting a million pound into a book so you can do crazy things. You can do a lot of stuff that you potentially wouldn't go in a film. And so that's mm-hmm. you know, that's one of the major considerations that you need to think about when you are thinking about film. Yeah. And it's not, it's not like you can't, you can't just, you know, you get like, say you get your budget, you get a million and a half dollars and you're doing a horror film and you definitely want to do practical effects. And you start looking at, you know, hey, I, you know, I've got a creature, we can do that, you know, and you find out that the cost of the creature is $800,000. You can't just go back and go, hey, can we have another million? And a million? Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you know, it's really, really good. You should see, I mean, you see the other film? You know, and and here's the thing. You might have this, you might have somebody who's like, you know what? I can get the money. Let's make it happen. And then you've got something that could be special, could flop, you know, but at the same time, you're probably going to have, you know, a hard sell after, especially since you've got all, you put all your eggs into one basket to try to just get a small budget. And now, you know, the first thing they're going to do is say, let's look at someone who's a little cheaper. Have we thought about CGI? You know, <laughs> and you're going to be like, no, yeah. but you don't have any control over that. <laughs> or unless you do, and then you, your movie may never get made. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly that. And and those decisions are that balance between what's, what's sellable, what the budget is going to be and what the end result is going to look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a fine thing. And the thing about making a film is that a film, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, a film is written three times. So you write a film when mm-hmm. you write the, the screenplay. Uh, then then you uh, rewrite it when you're shooting it because it might be, oh, we can't do that there because the storm's come up, so we've got to change this, or so-and-so's ill for that day, so they can't do that. So you might have to think on your feet. You might have to change some of the elements whilst you're actually filming. So that's the second time you write a film. And then the third time you write a film is when you're in the editing suite at the end on post-production, because then you've got everything you, you've captured and then you look at it and go, mm, yeah, okay, that shot didn't come out as well as we thought it was going to do. It doesn't really work there. Or, you know, we we thought this looked good on paper, but do you know what? When we watch it through, the pacing's off. We need to take this out here or move this over to here. So you, you're writing the film again. So even if you've spent all that time, you know, with a producer and you think, you know, your book's been written as a, as a screenplay. Hey, that's a nice screenplay. It still might come out pretty damn different when it gets to the end. Oh yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, and, and then you always think back to William, I think it's William Goldman who, you know, spent, you know, he wrote Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and, so many movies and spent so long in in Hollywood, and you know, and the, I think in the interview they asked him, you know, what 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 attributes you know to your success, and he just laughed and said, he goes, I learned very early that no one in this industry, really, no one in any type of industry, knows what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, and when you realize that, then you can, you know. You can make peace with it and you move on. <laughs> you know, and it's like, wow. <laughs> and But if you think about it, I mean, in any type of industry, you talk to the top people and you ask them some really, really hard questions. A lot of times they'll be like, well, that's things we would have to find out. And you're kind of like, you really don't know what you're doing, do you? <laughs> Everyone's blagging it, really. You know. Yeah. Fake it till you make it, baby. Yeah, you know, know. but but it's so true, and you get frustrated otherwise, especially in things like like the film industry when you Mm -hmm. uh, you think you know everything is kind of problem solving, and it's you know stuff's coming up, and you've just got to kind of get on and right, okay, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll we'll change this around, and if you think God, why doesn't everybody understand what they're doing? You're just going to go mad, you know. Mm -hmm. You said there, you know, you accept that, you make peace with it. It's like fine. Right, right. And then you got you got your film critics and stuff like that who I eagerly await all of their movies that will be perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, well, you know, it's like, they should have done this. Well, fuck, why didn't you get involved? <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I do. I've got a lot of respect for anybody that uh, does creativity and actually actually puts it out there. I got respect for um, some critics as well that sit there and take the time to dissect and review it because they are experts in the fact that they've seen a lot of stuff and they're if they're critiquing it in the right kind of way. Fair enough. All right, you know exactly. You created something and you're putting it out there, and it, it's 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 game for it. You know that's what it's mm -hmm. kind of like. But I like to always do a bit of research on some of the critics or reviewers and kind of see what stuff, what is, what are their tastes, because you know they might turn around and really hate a book, um, but that book might be because it's not really of their taste. Right. So I'll go back and look. What things do they generally like for? Uh, what have they reviewed before and what they've kind of scored and read through the reviews and you, you get a flavor of, of the people and then you can you can kind of work out you know how much of, of, of their stuff is really going to hit home to you or how much is just it's not their taste right yeah. there's different degrees of criticism that you know i can definitely appreciate you know someone who is not trying to 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 tear it apart they're like hey this is this this didn't work and here's why it, it, it didn't work in this particular instance and then keep in mind this is just my opinion but this is what i believe yeah you may find that it's others whereas the other type of criticism is that hey this doesn't work they should have done this if they and they could have done this and they could have done this and the next thing you know it's like golly man you're just adding a couple million dollars to the budget that they already had approved and probably went over anyway you know whatever <laughs> yeah yeah and that's the thing with a film there's a lot of moving parts um so there's a lot of things that can go wrong there's a lot of people involved in it a lot of stakes you know director always gets all the credit for it all well not all the credit but most of the credit for a movie but at the end of the day you got to look back and go well how good was that sound how good was that score how good was the actual camera work or the editing you know um, and and when you break it down into all those different parts and more, uh, you know, special effects, etc., you can kind of see all the elements that make up a movie. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you know, when it all comes together in in a movie, it is a rare beast. But it is good when that happens. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And I mean, when you got this message from the producer in LA, did you start researching them before accepting the offer? Did you have a look at other movies they'd worked on? Did you contact anyone within the industry for advice? I mean, what were your initial steps after being approached? Yeah, so, uh, well, they were very good. They, they sent over details of who they were, uh, the company they worked for, and their IMDb page. Mm. So... Um, so I didn't actually have to go and do much in the way of research because they gave it all to me. Uh, but they were, they were great. They were just like, yeah, okay, this is the stuff that we've done before. Here's who I am. Go check it out. So they were really, really open about that. So I did, obviously, go through and have a little look uh, and look at the, the, the different stuff. Um, and it was great. You know, a lot of the stuff in there I knew and I liked. And I was like, yeah, okay, this is fantastic. Um and then spoke to them on the phone and they were brilliant. You know, they, they, we chatted on the phone for a number of occasions. A first, just getting to know each other and understanding like, um, you know, who the other person was. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, the, the kind of work that they'd done, their sort of background. Um, and yeah, I think we spoke about, I don't know, good, good five, six times before, um, a contract came through was signed and then and, and uh, for the option yeah um, but but that was great you know because it was good you're able to build up a rapport uh understand you know how happy you are with working with that person do they understand your story uh what is their kind of vision for the story as well um because that's important you know you could have someone that really doesn't kind of get it and all right you might be just want to sort of take the money but at the same time you want that confidence that, uh, that, that, that all I personally did. I want the confidence that they understood exactly what the story was kind of about and what their vision was. So we spent quite a bit of time sort of fleshing it out and talking that through. And as I say, yeah, the research was made easy. I like people that are open and transparent. It's how mm. I run the publishing company with my authors. I tell them what's going on. You know, they're always told about every time 
um, I send over sales records to each one of them so they can see exactly kind of what's gone through from there. And when we produce a book, we talk about it in very much um, explain exactly what I'm about to do, what I need their input on, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I like to be that kind of transparent because it means you're not being devious, you're not hiding anything. Uh, and and um, the producer was exactly the same. They yeah. were that, that transparent right from the start. So it just breeds trust and collaboration right from there. Well, we've spoken a lot about printed editions of books. So I'm wondering if you look at going forward, I mean, how important is diversifying into things like audio books and is getting involved in the foreign rights, whether as a publisher or whether making contacts within the industry, something that you're interested in doing? Yeah. So, um, so audio books uh, are great. It is a booming market. Uh, I've seen sort of sales figures been reported uh, uh, before and like how well they're doing. And I just know from word on the street, you know, people that listen to audio books and they've listened to a lot of audio books in the last year or so that, and they've never done that before. So it is a fantastic market to get into. We've done a few uh, audio books in the past. Uh, and put them up and they're kind of doing okay um but it's more the sale model that that i don't know how it works so if i sort of explain most of us most of the stuff we publish at the moment are novellas um now audio books so the ones that we've run through a company called acx which uh, is basically audible you know the amazon um uh, audiobook market mm. Uh, if you use if you're using that, what you tend to to see is you you have you, you purchase credits and then those credits equal like a book, okay? But that doesn't really help out because if you've got one credit, are you going to spend it on a novella which is going to last for three and a half hours worth of talking, or are you going to spend it on a really massive epic novel which is eight hours? So the value for money thing doesn't kind of work out a lot there at the moment. So, it, and, and I know this just from speaking with people that, that have said, you know, they'd much rather, you know, they, they, they kind of look for the bigger books. It's not always the case, um, but I'm just kind of trying to work out a way of how to make the audio books more attractive. If yeah. That's the case. yeah, I hear you there. And we've put out, Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley, which is, of course, a novella. And then the girl in the video that I mentioned, I mean, that's being published via Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, but I'll be putting the audiobook out as This Is Horror. And, I mean, I think you're right that because it's a novella, there will be people who will be reluctant to spend a credit on it. And so there is a possibility that I might make a loss on that but i think the main reason is that audio as you say is such a booming market that it just seems like i'm missing something if i'm not putting it out in that medium but i mean i would say from monitoring the sales of ray cluley's book that you'll often find that a lot of people are just buying it outright so they're not lo using the credit but they're just spending however much it is to buy that book now the difficulty that comes in here is quite often audible will want to set or strongly recommend a price so then you're kind of hoping that they then price it less than one credit because otherwise people are going to want to use the credit, but then they're going to think, well, actually, though, this, as you say, is three hours long, so why don't we skip that one and get the 12-hour long book instead? Yeah. So it, 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 it is a difficult one. Um, but I know as well that I think choosing whether to go exclusively with Audible, where you're going to get a bigger percentage, you're choosing whether to go wide is a bit of a dilemma. So with Water for Drowning... I went with Audible, but I think for the girl in the video, I'm going to experiment going wide because if you do that, you can also get the book into a number of libraries 
So yeah. there are various audio apps. I mean, I've got a couple. If I just have a look now, there's one called Libby. There's one called BorrowBox. So if I link that to my library card, I can borrow whatever audio books I want. So if someone wants to read a novella via audio, well, they're going to have no problem taking it out of the library. So that might be a way to do it. But yeah, yeah, it's a funny one where it's an emerging market. But unless you've got a, a novel length work, it's not that lucrative at the moment. <laughs> it's yeah, difficult. The, yeah. <laughs> whilst, whilst, they, uh, whilst ASX has that kind of pricing structure and arrangement in place, it doesn't kind of work. But it's interesting what you were saying there about the fact that you know, oh, you try this way, so you can experiment in trying that way. Mm. And, and I think that that is not just in the audio market, but from a from a publishing point of view, that's kind of what we're all doing at the yeah. moment. It's, it's, it's experimenting with releasing stuff on different formats and in different ways, and and just trying to see what works. It's like you say, do I go exclusively down the Amazon route, or do I put it wider? And you kind of go, okay, well, let's try one book this way. Let's try another book that way, and let's kind of just sort of compare to see whether or not they they work. And yeah, no, it's it's heartening to hear. But that that that's the game, isn't it? It's just experimenting at the moment and playing because no one's got the magic bullet. No one knows. Hey, if you want to sell really well and reach the market, this is how you do it. Because traditional publishing's gone. That doesn't exist anymore. Really, it's all about you know you've got all these different ways of of, of reaching people. So it's 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 experimenting to find the right ones isn't it yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i mean it's interesting you say trad publishing is gone it's certainly transformed a lot over the last few years and we were speaking to adam neville recently and i mean he's now i, I mean it's, it seemed like from the conversation and he can tweet me and shout at me if i've got it wrong but it seems like he's almost preferring independent publishing these days because of the freedom that it allows him whereas before i mean he'd have a book that would come out in the uk or the us and then he'd have to wait for the rights to the other edition to be sold so it could mean he put a book out in the uk and then it doesn't turn up in america until a year later whereas if he's independently publishing he can put them out all at the same time, you can put a paperback out, a hardback, an audio edition, and it's all there. And I think because we're living in this global world, I mean, it makes sense for each territory to be able to access it at the same time. And I mean, it would be good as well if we saw that happen with film. And I think we are increasingly see that happen, seeing that happen, particularly with netflix but yeah when when we can all communicate it's it can be a little bit damaging when a series comes out in america and it only comes out in the uk six months later because invariably you've seen a ton of spoilers online and i mean, I mean through no fault of your own because normally the spoilers are thrown into the damn headline of the article <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there's that. So the spoilers kick around. All the other thing that happens, isn't it? People that don't want to wait, they go and they get a copy of it. They, they, you know, someone downloads it and torrents it and uploads yeah. it. Someone yeah. Takes it. Yeah, because you're giving them no legal way to do it, and you know, people aren't always guided purely by their morals. And no. I mean, I think some people who who download things illegally put their hands up and say, hey, you know what, I wanted to see it and I would have paid for it, but you didn't give me away. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and yeah, and it's like you say, people don't want to wait anymore because, well, hang on, my mate's in America and he's just seen that, so why can't I see it over here? You know, a week feels like a long time to wait between, between episodes if it's in America one week and then the next week in the UK. Yeah. So, but it's interesting you say the whole thing with uh, Adam Neville because you're right. I think what his last few books have all been published by himself. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reddening that came out in November that was the first novel that he'd put out independently. And I mean, Adam was with Pan Macmillan, so we're not talking about a small publisher here. So I think that really 
does talk does does indicate the shift away from traditional publishing when someone who is a mid list author is deciding to go it alone. And I think really yeah. the only people who are benefiting from traditional publishing are the real heavyweights and because they do have that brand recognition the publisher is going to put a lot of money into marketing and into their release and i mean again we were talking to christopher golden and he he's had a lot of titles that have been traditionally published but he said in in all the years of publishing there was only one book where they put a proper tour on to promote it so that that kind of speaks volumes too and it's it's interesting especially with the whole way it's been working um with the uh, with the traditional publishing is I, I understand it's going to be like that for a lot of books and a lot of genres but horror in particular is one of the genres that has been particularly um uh been particularly caught out with regards to the traditional publishing because it's it's not really sold mass market anymore mm. um you know you go into shops invariably you might find a horror section but you also might not you might find that your horror books is mixed somewhere in the fantasy section somewhere and it's just called fantasy can't even write the word mm. on, a, on a thing at the top because people don't think that it's marketable or it's sellable and so if you've got a, a, a big company, they're going to turn around and and and, and they, they won't want to throw money at it. Oh, that's a bit supernatural, that plot twist. Can we change that and make that a bit more human? Then we can sell it as a thriller. And then all of a sudden, you're not, you, you, you're not, what was your horror book? Isn't your horror book anymore? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I think I think about the different modes of publishing quite a lot and for me, I feel the sweet spot is that hybrid publishing model where you've got people like David Moody and presumably Adam Neville if he goes back to Pan Macmillan. <clears throat> you've also got Chuck Wendig. So they're putting out some books traditionally and they're putting out others independently because, I mean, the, the reality is that one thing that traditional publishers certainly do have is more reach than independent publishers. And if they choose to, they can get it into bookstores, they can get it into supermarkets, and you know, they, they can put advertisements up at the tube stations and at train oh, yeah. stations. Oh, yeah. And it but the the question mark is whether they will with your yes. book. That is that it's, is the gamble. It's exactly that. It's like you said, if they choose to. Yeah. And and it, it seems like, oh, ever since I've been in the horror game, it seems like if they choose to is no, because they don't believe that it's it, it's something that you can market and sell. And that's kind of the repercussion of that is they're not pushing horror books. They're not really selling horror books as such. And then what do you find? They're not going on the shelves. So then the shelves start to decline and it ends up in this kind of like vicious circle of the declining market. But the market still exists and we know it exists because we're part of it and we can see it. It's just it's not happening too much on a commercial high street level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've certainly put out big advertising campaigns for books that I would describe as horror tangential or books that are horror mixed with another subgenre. I mean, we've seen that with Sarah Pinbro. We've seen that with Alison Littlewood. And then, of course, for the titans of horror, I mean, if Stephen King has a book out, you're going to know about it. That's going to be plastered everywhere. Although the irony is, I feel that if Stephen King had a book out and he literally put one tweet out to let people know, he'd still probably sell millions of copies. Yeah, yeah. But then that's, you know, that's that's your fan base, isn't it? Yeah. is, is, is huge but it is but but going back to all those examples it goes to show that there is a market out there and it will sell mm. um so it's uh, it's why there is so many independent um small presses around at the moment really because that's the people that are producing books um mm-hmm. but you know for for the market out there that wants to read them 
Yeah, yeah. I, I think some of the the best publishers right now for horror are the presses that are technically independent, but at the same time are huge, like Cemetery Dance and Rebellion Publishing. So they're not affiliated with the big five, but they've accrued tens of thousands of fans and readers, so you're kind of getting the advantage of both if you go with one of those. And perhaps yeah. the same with tour. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's to get to that level. So so Sinister Horror Company can get to that level. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the aim, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, why not? If You know, we can set these aims, but if you plug away at it, then slowly but surely you're going to grow. I mean, that that's yeah. the way that it's worked for This Is Horror. I remember when we first started a Patreon and I thought, you know, if we could get to $50, that'd be nice, then $100. And, you know, at the moment we're aiming to hit $1,000. And I mean, when we got 100 patrons, that was a dream come true. And now we're, we're at nearly 200. So... Yeah, it it can happen, but it's it's a long game. That's the key, and mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it is, isn't it? It's exactly that. It's the long game, um, and you just got to play it and and not get frustrated. I think that's the thing that I've been pretty patient with everything, with regards to the Sinister Horror Company, uh, which is great, you know. And it, it's sort of paid off to do to you want to be patient and experiment and, and play around. Um, you know, I know that the back catalogue is all great. It's all good quality stuff. So, and that will only increase as I keep releasing more books. So, um, yeah, just over time, we will get there. Yeah. As it, as it mean there, I just mean we will get bigger. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think something that resonated was you said something along the lines of, yeah, you know, there are more readers out there. There are more people who would enjoy having sinister horror company books in their life. It's just finding a way to get the word out there to them. And I, I've said for a long time, I know that there are a thousand people that would want to become a patron of this is horror podcast. The problem is some of them haven't even listened to an episode yet. They'd love it, but they don't know it yeah, exists. That's, that's right. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's the exposure, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, to round things out, we've got a couple of questions from Patreon. So the first one, or in fact, the first three, looking at the amount of question marks, is from David Watkins. So he says, have you considered writing a sequel to Mad Dog? Also, what was your process for writing that book? And was it always written in that style i.e. interviews, diaries, etc., or was it a happy experiment? Ah, okay, yeah, interesting. So, um, how, what was the first one? Have I planned a sequel for Mad Dog? Yeah, well, have you considered writing a sequel so you don't even have to have planned it? <laughs> yeah, so have I considered? Yes, I have. Um, I have considered writing a sequel, and I have even started it I've written the first couple of chapters, but I wasn't 100% happy with uh, where it was going. So I've just so I put it aside uh, and just letting the idea mature in my head. Um, the, the the main thing about it is so it's Mad Dog being written up like it's a set of interviews um, that have been sort of all cut up, and the, and it's a really interesting style to write in, but it's also quite a difficult style to write in um so i did go i did think about writing a sequel and then i thought do you know what i want to write a book in a different narrative style before i come back to it so yeah i i have considered it i may well write a sequel to it um but i think it would be something else released first so so i can write in a different style um and and then and what was the question was it um so the the process for writing that book and then closely linked to that was it always written in that style or was it a happy experiment uh yeah okay so yeah so so the process i mean we kind of discussed it um a bit earlier was the fact that i was given a cover or i saw a cover i wanted mm. that 
paper. And so, so it had the cover and it had the title. So I knew it involved, there was a wall on it and it was called Mad Dog. And that was kind of it. So um, I came up with lots of different ideas because I love werewolves. It was one of my favorite things when I was a kid. And I always wanted to write a werewolf book. Um, so I brainstormed a whole bunch of ideas whilst researching wolves and werewolves. Um, and then uh, one day just sat there and wrote out a little synopsis, uh, almost like a, like a blurb on the back of the book, which kind of neatly described, with only slight variations, the, the main plot of the book. Uh, and that was it. So then I was like, right, OK, so now I've got the idea of what the plot's going to be just in one little paragraph. Um, and I got the cover. So so that was that there. Then I started to come up with the ideas of how I was going to write it. And initially, it was going to be written just as a straight prose. Um, and I planned everything out because I, I like to plan everything chapter by chapter before I start writing. So I got the, the, the basic idea of the plot uh, all there. And it was only as I was kind of going through the basics of plot and making sure that I had everything planned out chapter by chapter that I realised I didn't want to write it in just the normal way because I, I was worried it was just going to bore me. I always like to, when I write something, it needs to be a challenge to me. Um, and if I've written in a certain style before or just recently, I don't really want to go back and write in that same style again. So I knew I wanted to write something different. And I don't know if you've ever read it, but um, Chuck Palahniuk, who I'd mentioned previously, he wrote a book called rant yeah uh, yeah now that is probably one of my all-time favorite books um i've read it three times and i'm considering rereading it again but i was actually reading it at the time rereading it at the time when i was plotting out mad dog and i loved the style of this broken up interview and i just thought well that's fantastic and i i, I wondered can i actually write like that myself so that was the idea that then came to me on Mad Dog. I thought, well, fine, let's try and write in that kind of style. Um, so, yeah, so it was it was a challenge to myself to try and do it, um, which I think oh, I did I did pretty well at. Um, but it's not an easy style to write. It's very uh, choppy. And because it's people talking about stuff, you can't go off into uh, poetic prose and lyrical flair about describing something. So that was the only sort of bit that I did miss uh, from from writing on it. Yeah, but I think, I mean, as you've said throughout this conversation, experiments and testing yourself and trying something different is clearly part of who you are, not just as a creative, but as a person. And I think it keeps things interesting and to see, can I actually do this? Yeah. Yeah, no, ag agreed. Um, uh, I think you just need to do it to keep your interest. Mm. You know, if you're, if you're just writing and you're just doing the same stuff again and again and again, I'm going to get bored. And if I'm bored, it's going to come through because the story is going to end up being lazy. Uh, and uh, and that would just be an absolute crime. Whereas if, you, if you're trying something new and you're pushing yourself, you're keeping everything in your writing sharp because it's 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 all kind of new and so you've got to keep everything at your a game as best you can yeah i mean elmore leonard said in terms of writing that he skips the boring bits and i mean if you're boring yourself then you are sure as hell gonna be boring the reader <laughs> absolutely well thomas joyce would like to know as a publisher and an author how do you find the balance between creating your own work and the work of others? Well, that's a good question. Um, and uh, I say throughout the five years, I probably at some points didn't get the balance right. Um, but the way that I do it now or, or, or have done it in the past is it's about lining yourself up with a, a kind of a schedule and kind of sort of planning not formally on a gantt chart or anything like that but kind of in my mind i know roughly how long it's going to take to publish a book uh from start to finish uh in the elements of, of when they're going to come in and then i try and weave that around my own work as well uh, and as I've got books coming in, we, I work out when they're going to be released. So with that in mind, 
I can then plan in when the publishing work's going to kick in and when the writing work's going to kick in. And I kind of, I, I like to keep them mainly separate, but there's times when they will sort of come together. Because the irritating thing is if you're writing something, you don't want to be distracted, or I personally do not like to be distracted by somebody else's prose. Uh, so, so the me- But if I'm editing stuff, that's not a problem at all. So if I'm writing, say, my first, second draft of, a, of my own books, I wouldn't be looking at anybody else's at the same time. But when I come back to edit stuff, I can then go back, and I can I can be doing other publishing stuff at the same time. So I set up these kind of these blocks of time, uh, time for publishing, time for writing, time for publishing, time for writing. In the past, I've been guilty of doing too much publishing um, and not enough of my own writing. Because if you're shown these fantastic stories, you just want to get them out there, you know, and you get excited. It's like now I so so there are times now that I've learned where I've gone to people, yeah. That is great. I really want to put that out, but I'm going to have to wait because I've got this block of time, which is like where dedicated to my writing. So um, then I can give them a timetable of saying, you know, that's great, but we, I probably won't get a chance to be able to put that out for six months. Is that going to be OK? And then the author can make that decision to say yes or no. They'll go and look somewhere else. Yeah. And I mean, I love the idea of balance but I mean my own life is not as organized as that and I I tend to find that I have seasons so there'll be a time where I'm going hard on the publishing and then I decide actually I want to concentrate on the podcast so then I'll be doing that and then there'll be other times where I'm like actually I want to put out more of my own work so I mean that's why at the moment I've eased off a little bit on the publishing because I kind of want to prove myself as a writer. So this is the writing season. I'm sure at some point I'll feel like, okay, I've proven myself more. I can go back to publishing. And I mean, it certainly, it keeps things exciting. It probably keeps things a little bit erratic, but if it's interesting and people are enjoying what I'm doing, I mean, what, what else is there to do really? Yeah, and there is that thing. You guys probably get this as well, uh, being sort of, you know, d- do it, doing publishing, doing podcasts, and doing your own writings is the fact that um, everything else sometimes overshadows your writings, mm. and you need to remind people every now and again that uh, you you do write by releasing something new. Um, I mean, how do you guys find that? Do you find yourself overshadowed sometimes by all the other stuff you do outside of writing? Um, I mean, I, I think it really is a case of prioritization. So, I mean, when I started This Is Horror, the focus was getting This Is Horror established. And then in terms of publishing, it was more a question mark as to, is this something I can do? And then eight or ten or however many books it was later it was like okay this is something I can do I don't have to prove it to myself as much so I can actually ease off a little bit with the podcast it was again kind of an experiment Um, the podcast is almost the exception to the rule though because I proved that I could do it but then it's the one thing in my life where I haven't actually slowed down. <laughs> I think it's because I just found a way that I could incorporate it into my life and my schedule without it taking over from everything else. So I found a rhythm and a time where I can edit, where I can have these conversations, and it works pretty well for me. But, I mean, I think it was in 2016, even though I've always been writing from a young age I thought if I'm gonna identify as a writer I need to do this more seriously and I need to put more things out there so then I stopped doing as much publishing because I thought I'm spending a lot of time on other people's releases when I could be spending it on my own and so now I've been writing a lot more and I feel that I am proving myself and I have earned that identity that label as a writer but actually I'm hungry to get more out there and I'm hungry to 
achieve in that sense. So it's all about prioritization and deciding what are the most important things for me at the moment. And I think, yeah, if I look at podcasting, editing, publishing, and writing of those four facets, I can probably concentrate on two at at once if I want to do them effectively. And so at the moment, we're in the podcasting and writing season with just a little bit of freelance editing on on the side. But I mean, people do come to me with with books and they want to see if I can publish them. And that there are some great stories there as well. So I do get the itch to jump back into it. And I'm sure that I will. But at the moment, I just have to be disciplined and, and to accept that my time it's finite and I'm in a writing and podcasting season of my life and you know let, let's let see what changes what variables come into play and then maybe I'll be back into the publishing game it's just about seeing what works for me and I think what is absolutely key is not burning out because I mean, it it was 2016 where I did burn out because I was teaching full time. I was doing this as horror full time as well. I was hardly getting any sleep. And then I just found myself very ill. And I said, well, something has to give and it's either going to be my health or it's going to be my teaching or it's going to be this is horror. And well, I wasn't giving up this is horror. I couldn't give up my health. And so it was very easy to then go from full-time to part-time teaching because it, it was the only thing that I was prepared to give up. See, and I'm the exact opposite. Because I have a full-time job that makes me money. And I'm a very slow writer. So it, it's, I think I've worked out a system that works for me. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. I mean, we've, we've said so many yeah. times, your mileage may vary. Do what works yeah, exactly. for you. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. know? Um, and it's, you know, trying to come up with a story or something like that, it, it takes me a while. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's because I put a lot of, of pressure on myself to where I whenever I feel that the, the story is good enough and I can send it out, then I know that an editor is going to look at it and see some merit there. So I would rather, you know, to me, it's more focused on quantity uh, and quality. And also, I also write outside of other things. So in other words, like pretty soon, I, I, I kind of block time to where I can write because I know there's something that's going to be coming up Resident Evil 3 that I'm going to yeah. be <laughs> spending a lot of time on. So uh, I try to get some things done, you know, uh, at least get a foothold on some things because I know that once something, that the, the other big thing coming out that I want to experience that could actually give me some inspirado you know, then I'm going to be focusing on that. And, you know, and occasionally you find the other, you know, time sinks that, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to try that out. And the next thing you know, it's like, you know, four days later, you know, it's like, I can't stop doing this. Oh my God. You know, but, uh, it, it's just a, to me, it's just a focus on quantity. Not people all the time. It's like, Hey man, we're going to see another Bob Pastorella story. I don't know. When, when you get to it, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not under a deadline for anything. Um, though I do find a lot of times I'm, I'm under a deadline that I do like some really good work. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it's weird. <laughs> it's just weird. Your mileage may vary. That is so true. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'll be going into a different season soon because when i return to japan in april i'm gonna be teaching full time and that's the first time that i'll have been teaching full time since burning out but you know i promise you all that i'm not gonna burn out i am gonna manage my time properly and 
you know, I, I've, I hope, learned from that lesson. But I think when I burnt out, I felt that I had a lot to prove and I, you know, was pretty insecure as to my writer identity. Whereas now, particularly with this book coming out in a few months and then another one coming out next year and then me and Bob have a collaboration that we're hoping to release this Halloween. I mean, that's three books and a number of short stories in the space of a year. So I feel it'd be wrong to <laughs> to, to question my identity as a writer. I mean, yeah. that's, that's quite a lot, really. <laughs> yeah, and you've got that consistency. So that's important. You yeah. Know, just to keep reminding people that you still exist and keep having some uh output and keep putting it out there you know it doesn't have to be a lot it could even be only a book a year but it's enough you know yeah yeah and and don't you find that that you do have to keep reminding people because we're in such a fast-paced world and not only are we competing with other books but we're competing with other forms of entertainment i mean obviously there's resident evil 3 which bob mentioned i mean no one's gonna compete with that so forget about it but there's also <laughs> netflix there's different videos on demand there's the cinema so you you have got a lot that you're competing with yeah yeah and so so yeah just that reminder of uh, hello i exist i'm yeah, out there yeah yeah then yeah, that's all it takes that's why i've always had a book out pretty much one a year at least if nothing else mm. um, but that's it now i don't have anything else so i need to write something for this year otherwise i won't get something out yeah but um, i mean at least even if you didn't put a book out heading up sinister horror company that is a reminder of sorts and yeah. Here, here you are on the podcast also reminding people you know they, yes. they thought they could get away from you if they weren't reading yeah. a book yeah. surprise motherfuckers i'm on a podcast the joys of doing the conventions and stuff as well is that you're just out there all the time you know you're meeting people um you're talking about your books and you're selling your books and you're always meet every time i go to a convention i will always meet new readers i it, so, you know, they, they are out there, which is great because it means that people that there's a lot of people out there that still haven't read the books I've released previously. So, mm. yeah. Well, to finish off, what is something you have changed your mind about recently? In what context? In any con context? In absolutely any context. What is something I've changed my mind about recently? Ooh. Uh, what have I changed my mind about recently? Could be life, could be a philosophy, could be political. Um, I guess you could go for humorous. Maybe you went to try a jumper on this morning and you were like, actually, I changed my mind about that one. Um... I'm just trying to think what I've changed my mind about. I'm sure there was a film, but I can't remember. I was, th I was thinking about this only the other day, about the fact that when you uh, watch films or... Um, oh, yeah, I know what it was. So it was a film. So a f something that I've changed my mind about recently is The Hateful Eight by Quentin Tarantino. Have you seen that? I have, and I'll be very interested to know which direction you go in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so my changing of my mind is that Hateful Eight is actually a really good movie. That is uh, uh, the, the correct opinion, I can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> you! <laughs> it has its moments of brilliance, yes. <laughs> I mean, well, when I first watched it, it was, uh, I, I went to the cinema and it was long. I had a voiceover in the middle of it. Um, it was really well shot and it was really well acted, but I kind of, I was expecting something like, hey, where's the hook? Where's where's the where's the, the bit about what the film's going to be about? And I didn't realise what we were watching was what the film was about. Right, right. You know? um, but once, but I came back and rewatched it recently and uh, obviously my palate had, had been it had adjusted because I knew the boundaries of the film. I knew what the film was going to be. 
So I sat down and rewatched it and I loved it. I thought it was really good. I had a similar experience with, um, you've seen the film Kill List? I have, yeah, yeah. So again, oh, yeah. Yeah, now that film uh, is, is brilliantly acted, brilliantly directed, brilliantly shot. It is a fantastic movie. I absolutely adore it. But when I first when I first watched it, I bought it on DVD, I think it was at the time, and I took it back to the shop and got a refund. And I never normally do that, but I was so miffed at the ending. A, the twist at the end I saw come in. Um, fine, fair enough. You know, not all twist land. That doesn't matter. But it was the fact that, like, nothing was explained and you were leading up to this point where you think it was all going to be explained. Mm. And, and the fact that it wasn't really riled me. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. So then I went back and rewatched it and uh, a little while later and went, OK, this is amazing. Because I knew it wasn't going to deliver a, an explanation at the end. It was like, fine, OK, so I knew that. So now I watch it in context of what it is. And brilliant. Mm -hmm. See, brilliant. And sometimes not having the explanation is what makes it linger. Yes. And that was the point with that movie was that I kept mm -hmm. thinking about it afterwards. So it did linger. Um, right. it, it wasn't that it was really being a lazy way out. And actually, I've read some really interesting essays on that movie since that talks about kind of trying to get the explanations to it. And that's that's kind of fun. The fact that people are like, well, if you piece this and this and this together, this mm -hmm. is kind of like leading up to this. You know, there's a reason as to why he's going after all these targets and all this kind of stuff. And then the bits at the end. You uh, kind of wonder, too, does the, it mean it's like when you see these type of articles and stuff like that online when it's doing the explanation. I always imagine like, you know, especially like this movie in particular, like Ben Wheatley would be like, huh. Maybe they have an idea because I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I do think that. It's like, did did did, did he have a, a plot in mind like that link in mind? Um, mm -hmm. and, and and when it comes out, it's like that thing, like you say, that he looks and goes, "Oh, actually, maybe their idea is better than mine." Let's just pretend it's that, then, shall we? You know. Yeah, exactly. They don't know. I mean, it's it's like when we talk to Brian Evanson because he writes a lot of ambiguous stuff. You know, there's the ambiguity has 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 a lot to do with it, but there's also some things that happen that just defy explanation. And when he says it's that, it's a discovery process for him too. And he, a lot of times he doesn't have the answers; he's just trying to find the answer. And the only way you can is by exploring it in a story. Yeah, good point. Very good point. Yeah, and where where I thought you might go is when. We spoke to Kathy Kojo, and I mean, one bit of advice mm -hmm. she had that she learned early on is if a reader has a theory as to how your story worked and what was going on, if you don't agree with it, just let them have that. You know, don't correct them because, you know, like it, it's kind of interesting to have that ambiguity and to let that story continue to be written with other theories and suggestions and sometimes the reader might come up with something that sounds very smart and wasn't at all what you intended and you're like yeah i'm not gonna correct you i'm gonna let you have that one yeah no well, i think that's great i mean that just gives us like you say it gives the story more life it's like living and breathing inside of other mm. people yeah, yeah. It's wonderful if people can theorize that way. I always think that it's a, it's a good mark of a well-written book to kind of leave a slight possibility of, a, of reinterpretation in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, thank you for chatting with us for most of your afternoon. This has been a lot of fun, and I hope that people are going to go out and explore Sinister Horror Company and get some of your titles if... They have yet to do so, but I mean, I wonder where can people connect with you? Uh, yeah, so the easiest place to go is just on our website, which is sinisterhorrorcompany.com. Nice and easy to remember. Um, mm -hmm. That will have all the social media links on there as well. But on social media, you can find us. We've got Facebook, Twitter and Instagram platforms as well. So uh, you find us in just by searching the name. But if you go to the website, click on the links, it'll take you to those places. All right. 
Do you have any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Uh, any final thoughts? Mm. The only final thought I would say is, well, thank you guys very much. And to everyone listening to This Is Horror Podcast, well done. You mean, you mean you know, that the podcast is keeping going and it's a fantastic podcast. It's a good work, you guys. Oh. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror with J.R. Park. Join us next episode when the tables are turned because Dan Howarth and Bob Pastorella will be interviewing me. And we are doing that to coincide with the release of my novella, The Girl in the Video. It's coming out on April the 28th, so if you haven't pre-ordered it, there's still time to do that. But hey, if not, pick up a copy as soon as it's out. And I'm really, really excited. I'm blown away by the response that I've got thus far. It's been overwhelmingly positive. I appreciate so many of you for for ordering it, for reviewing it, for interviewing me, for posting your amazing pictures on Instagram, for the YouTube videos. So thank you so very, very much. And if you want to hear even more from me, if you want to hear me on a number of podcasts, then a lot of episodes are about to drop. But Out Already is an episode on the Necronomy.com in which I unbox Ringu. And then as of today, the fantastic new podcast from Glenn Parker, Does the Dog Die in This? is now available. And it is a 90-minute conversation. We get into an awful lot. Of course, we talk about this as horror, and we talk about the girl in the video, but we also talk about steps for setting up your own podcast. We talk about dealing with positive and negative reviews. We talk about faking it until you make it. And we also learn about Glenn's encounter with what was incredibly like a real-life Texas Chainsaw Massacre house. So for that alone, I think it is worth listening in. So that podcast is called Does the Dog Die in This? And the audio quality is strong. The cover art is great. This is one to look out for so certainly download that today now before i wrap up let us have a quick word from our sponsors water for drowning by ray cluley narrated by rj bailey is the brand new audiobook from this is horror including the british fantasy award-winning story shark shark Dive in and download Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley on Audible today at bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning in the US and bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning UK in the UK. Following a cryptic message from her brother, Beth Davis finds herself in the strange coastal town of Netherworld Bay and discovers a secret cult planning to bring about the end of days. Can she stop them in time, or will she lose her very soul forever? The Netherwell Horror is a terrifying, blood-soaked tale that is not to be missed. Available in ebook and paperback and now on audio, search The Netherwell Horror on Audible or Amazon now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Now, perhaps some of you are itching to hear that conversation with myself where... Dan Howarth returns to This Is Horror Podcast for the first time in two years. And honestly, I can't blame you. I mean, Dan being back on This Is Horror is exciting. And guess what? There is a way that you can listen to it right now. You can listen to it ahead of the crowd by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And not only do you get every episode ahead of the crowd... You get to submit questions to each and every guest. 
you get to listen to our Q and A sessions. And me and Bob have been busy putting a load of those together for you, including some with Max Booth the Third. And in addition to that, you get the ten dollar video cast on camera off record and story unbox the horror podcast on the craft of writing. So head over to patreon.com forward slash this is horror and see if it is a good fit for you. All right, as always, I would like to end with a quote, and this is from F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is part of the beauty of literature. You discover that your longings are universal longings, that you're not lonely and isolated from anyone. You belong. I'll see you in the next episode for a very special The Girl in the Video podcast with the returning This Is Horror veteran, Dan Howarth. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.